Good morning and happy Monday. Welcome to the first day of the week. Thank you so much. Those of you who are here live, um, please make sure you say hi. Tell us where you're from. Converse with us. Ask questions. Um, even though this is um, an interview, an interview format, we want to make sure that we're including as many people as possible that want to dialogue with us as we are dialoguing with each other. So this morning we're doing another Extraordinary Stories with Extraordinary People. Um, my name is Amy Kocek with Amy Kocek Creative. And this idea was birthed out of my love for storytelling and not just my love for it, but my belief that stories are what connect us. The most important, I say this all the time, the most valuable asset that you possess is your story. And when I was, um, when I ghostwrite for people, or when I tell people I'm a ghostwriter, I, I get the same reaction. Um, Aloha, Charles. Um, I get the same reaction, which is, oh, I've always wanted to write a book, or I know someone that should write a book. And then I follow up the question with, well, why haven't you? And then excuse, excuse, excuse. And not to say that those aren't good excuses, but, um, what I realized is that sometimes people fight their own insecurities or they overthink their stories or there's a lot of shame and guilt in their stories. So the goal of this is to set people's stories free. It's to um, to share our stories with each other so that we can be connected. So as with all of my interviews, I encourage everybody who is watching either live or through the replay, connect, connect with the people that are on here. We always put their, um, their social media links and anything else that they're doing. So connect, ask questions. Um, if you resonate with anything that they're saying, connect, encourage them, um, draw upon their wisdom. That is the purpose for why we do what we do with extraordinary stories with extraordinary people. So today I am so excited. I have my friend Kareem Canston here. Um, me and Kareem met a couple years ago um, at a, I don't, a seminar workshop. Yep. Training. <laughs> one of those things um and kareem has such a phenomenal story and i think one of the things that's so fascinating about this is that you don't hear a lot about this aspect of mental health a lot of times when we hear about mental health it's somebody's personal story with their own struggle with mental health but kareem mm -hmm. has a story of having to um experience it secondhand growing up in a household with parents who struggled with mental health so he has a phenomenal short story that he's going to share with us so kareem we're just going to jump right off and sure. have you um introduce yourself who are you what do you do any other relevant information you want to share with us well thank you amy very much for inviting me uh, on your, your show today um thank you very much for uh sharing this time with me. You could have shared it with somebody else. And so um, just to let you all, all know that Amy, I met, met her at a Speaking Empire event. And if you need to actually get a book written, you got to work with her because she's really good. <laughs> Thank um, you. And so uh, I think I've been, I told her a little bit earlier that I've been putting off two books and I think I probably need to work with you to get one out, <laughs> you know, as soon as possible. <laughs> Uh, but a little bit about me. So um, I grew up in Queens, New York, and I probably moved uh, 14 plus times up until the age of 18. Um, grew up in a household that actually um, my parents struggled with mental illness. And, you know, this is something that I've been kind of like keeping to the side, you know, probably not trying to talk about. But I really felt that it was important to share a story from, you know, a child's view um, or, you know, a son's view about, you know, how did you uh, grow up in a household, but also how do you, you know, make changes um, while growing up in a household that had many challenges. And so, um, and like you said, many people talk from, you know, this is my story with mental illness, but what does it, what does it look like when you grow up in a family that somebody is struggling with mental illness and how do you work with uh, the issues that they have? Yeah. Um, so I, I want you to, cause I know we always talk about one pivotal moment and we're going to get mm -hmm. to that. Yep. We're going we're gonna to go backwards. And I want you to really take us there into your world in growing up in a household with parents that are struggling with mental illness. What does that, what does that look like? Um, how do you relate to your parents? What's the dynamic in the house? Like give us as many, um, just take us there, paint the picture for us. 
Sure, sure. Um, is very, very good questions. And so, you know, if if you know anyone that that struggles with mental illness, is that usually they have good days and they have bad days. And sometimes that could be weeks, that could be months, good, good months, bad months. And so when I was growing up, I, I, um, my parents will struggle with taking care of themselves, but also taking care of their children. So many times um, my family would actually take care of uh, myself and my siblings. I have two older brothers. Um, I'm the youngest. And, you know, when you're growing up in a home where you're just looking for an adult to take care of you, but they can't do that. That's a that's a huge blow to you as a child, right? You 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 want your mother, you want your father to take care of you, but they don't have the ability to do that. And so what happens is that now you get upset with them, right? You you don't like them, you hate them, um, you get pulled out of the home and put in somebody else's home, and you say, Why doesn't my mother or my father love me to take care of me? And so you don't realize until you know you. I guess you grow up or you you have a, a sense of awareness of what's happening that actually the mental illness is preventing them from being 100 percent um, there to take care of their family. You know, and so I, I it took a long time of struggle to understand that until I was age 18 that um, my my parents, even though that they didn't have a physical disability that you can see, they had a mental disability, and so. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, it's easy to see somebody that has, has, has been hurt, you know, physically, but when their mind is not working, right. Um, that's, that's a tough thing that to work on. I like what somebody says, generational cycles, uh, Charles, good post. Um, but yeah. And, and, and as a child, um, when you're in and out of different homes, right. I was, I was never in, in state care, but I was in family care. That's what I call it. Um, those people took it upon themselves to help out um, the children in that situation. And then sometimes help the parents. And so very unstable household, um, sometimes didn't know where I was going to live or where I was going to go. And then after you become a, a teenager, um, you start trying to make decisions for yourself. So how old were you when you realized that your parents were different? Like that maybe this, maybe there was something off. I would say elementary school. Um, you know, my mother and father, uh, elementary school, yeah, I went to go live with um, my family for a couple of years. And so during that, you're saying, all right, you're a young kid, <laughs> right? You know, um, in kindergarten and first grade and say, hey, where's my mother and father? They can't take care of me. But I know I used to go see my mother um, in the hospital. Um, and so you you already, already knew that something wasn't right. And my father sometimes would, uh, would have some issues also. And he would be in, in the house, in the household, out, outside the household. Um, and so many times I went to go live with family members. Um, but also I had the opportunity to see my parents when I, I lived, uh, with my family members. And so, um, as a young kid, you know, you didn't, you didn't see everything, but you knew something wasn't right. You so knew that it wasn't in the household. Yeah, as a young kid, you're going to like mental health hospitals and visiting your your mother while she's being admitted. Yeah. And then, then your father's absent. So how are you how are you processing this as a as a kid? Like is can you sense like emotional changes or did this kind of just become your normalcy? Are you asking questions like what's wrong with mom? What's wrong with dad? How are you well, processing this? Good question. One of the interesting things is that my I was the youngest grandchild, so I was sheltered a lot by my family, <laughs> yeah, yeah. more than my brothers. Um, and I think that because I was the youngest grandchild, uh, I was always with an adult. Um, uh, I always would be around an adult, and adults would actually, you know, um, keep me away from certain things. And so um, I have it. I didn't experience a lot of how can I a lot of information given to me. I saw some stuff. Of course, you, when you have parents with mental illness, sometimes they have good days and sometimes they don't. And, it, and if you're in that household, you're going to see the bad days and the good days. And, you know, um, those things, you know, are could be traumatic. Um, those things could could, you know, break people and it has broken people. Um, I have other family members that struggle with mental illness and some of them live like they still are, you know, 10, 20 years ago with that incident, you know? And so, um, but as a, you know, growing up as a teenager, I remember, you know, myself making a decision that, listen, I, I didn't want to live with my parents anymore. And so my brother 
and myself moved and lived with my 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 aunt and my uncle. Um, and we made a decision to say, listen, we, we just can't live in this environment and we want to make a better, better living for ourselves. Yeah. So, um, you know, an eighth and ninth grade, we made that decision. Yeah. On on the you refer to them, you know, the good days and the bad days. So on on the bad days when you're dealing with with mental illness and it's a bad day for your parents. Um, how do you handle that as a kid? Like, are you trying to calm them down? Are you calling for help? Like, how severe is a bad day for you? Um, usually, I wasn't calling calling for help. I mean, um, you know, you might experience stuff, or you know, I guess in my household, a lot of times, uh, you know, my mother would would share information with my father. Uh, I mean, about my father, her with the family. So the family would make a decision. Listen, this is what we're doing. You know, um, or they know that you know the the, the kids. Um, wasn't being taken care of a certain way. And so they, there was never like abuse, you know, yeah. any physical abuse or, or mental abuse in my family, just that my parents just didn't have the capability to take care of, take care of, well, take care of themselves and take care of a kid. And so some of those days, most, you know, sometimes I would go play with my friends. Um, I remember in middle school, I used to have friends that um, used to go to church probably like five days a week. And so to get away from the, the craziness, I would go and stay with them you know, yeah. go, go to church or hang out with their, in their household. Um, and so, you know, there's the things, you know, that you have to get away from and shelter yourself. People usually yeah. call, you know, when I was growing up, I'm like a turtle, right? When a turtle gets scared, they, they go into their shell yeah. and they're protected by the outside forces. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you found yourself becoming angry. Um, what age would you say did you start becoming angry with your parents? I would say probably probably middle school. Um, you know, when you get a little bit older and wiser and you you start, you know, understanding things a little bit more, you, you say to yourself, like, you know, I'm upset because this person is not providing for me what I think they should provide. Yeah. Right? And usually with, with kids, they get upset with their parents about that. You know, you should, you know, provide a safe environment for, for me, right? You should yeah. you should have a home where I could come come into the home and I could um, study or I could get help with my my homework. Um, you should provide a home for me and, and, and we not get kicked out of a home because you don't have it together. And so you, you start, you know, hating people. Um, you start getting upset um, with the people that's supposed to provide you this uh the security and yeah. so i would say probably up until i went to college i, I really hated my parents you know and it, it took me you know i really say god uh, telling me that i need to forgive my parents and i can't go back and change the past but i could change my future yeah and and those are the things that you know i really want people to understand is that yes you might have grew up in a in a tough environment Yes, your parents, you might have known your parents, not knowing your, your parents, been adopted by somebody or your parents said they was going to do something. They, they didn't do it. That doesn't mean that you put your life on hold because of what you went through. Yeah. You got to look towards the future. And so at the age of 18, I, you know, I went to high school. I mean, I, I graduated from high school while I was in high school. My junior year, I went into the Army National Guard. That was kind of like my way out. Um, and then I went you know, the summer that I graduated from high school, I went into straight into the Army National Guard, came back home for a couple of days and went straight to college. And, yeah. you know, my parents, you know, said they were going to help me um, pay for college. They didn't. I was, you know, deflated by that. You know, my my, my brother, one of my brothers called me say, hey, man, you need to leave college. And I said, nah, man. I said, if I got here, I'm going to stay here. So um, I had to do the, the tough thing, take out student loans. And so, but at that time, I realized that, listen, if I want to move forward in my life, there's certain things in my past that I have to um, forgive. I'm not going to forget it, but I had to forgive my parents. I need to understand that they were struggling with, with mental illness. It was something that they they didn't bring on themselves. It was just incidents that that actually that they, they struggle with. And, and yes, they have, you know, took medication, go to counseling, um, you know, but I had to move forward. And so sometimes we as people, Yes, we might have been dealt a bad life. That doesn't mean that we have to stay back living in the past. Yeah. So that that is so interesting because 
So if I if I equate what's happening is like the first 18 years of your life, right? And it's like you're you're moving around, you're very unstable environment, your parents aren't caring for you, you're having to process all of this at a young age. Then you get out of the house and now you're dealing with anger and then you're going to college and promises that they made they're not fulfilling like you're moving around at this point nope. where you say i know that it's important for me to forgive mm -hmm. and then you get to the point of saying figuring out that they have mental illness and having compassion upon them so my question is because not everybody gets to the place that you've got like so many people stay in the place of this happened to me. These people did this to me and they never move past that. So how do you get to where you're at, to where you're able to move past it, forgive and to see them through eyes of compassion as opposed to through eyes of judgment? Wow, that's a good question. I usually tell people failure is an event. It's not a person. Mm -hmm. I would say it again. Failure is an event and it's not a person. And so many times we label people um, like like that's who they are, right? And so if I labeled my parents as um, um, people that have mental illness versus say this is what they struggle with, you know, they're being labeled as having mental illness for the rest of their life. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I realize is that, listen, you know what, this is something that they struggle with. And yes, these are things that they could probably get over possibly, you know, with, uh, with medication and, um, social, you know, going to a psychiatrist or, or maybe prayer and God. Um, but I had to come to a realization that, you know what, this is, these are the people that were used to bring me into the earth, right? Yes. Those are my biological parents. I need to respect them. Right. Um, but I need to make a decision about my life going forward and I'm in control of my life. And if I allow myself to live back in when I was five or six, seven, eight, 16 years old, then I'm going to be a 16 year old living in a 40 something year old body. Mm -hmm. And That's so many people, I like that. You know, I know people, I know family members that they still talk about 30 years ago, like it's today. Mm -hmm. You know, they still talk about how somebody hurt them and, and, and what somebody did to them. And as a child, what, what things, opportunities they didn't receive. But I tell them, Listen, you got breath in your body today. Why don't you make a, a difference and a change now? Stop yeah. talking about how your mother didn't do this for you. Stop talking about that you were born in a family that didn't have a lot of money or didn't have a lot of education. That doesn't mean that you can't obtain these things. And so many people are holding themselves back because they can't look into the future. Yeah. They're living like the past is in their present. I love that. You know. um, I worked at a, I worked in a, um, a lockdown facility for troubled youth. And I remember mm. a, a psychiatrist told us, he said, um, if you have unresolved trauma, you mentally stay at that age of the unresolved trauma until you resolve it. So wow. just like you said, like if you have trauma and that trauma was at five, six, seven years old and you don't resolve it, you'll physically grow up. Like you'll still age, but <laughs> mentally you'll stay at that age and mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you'll stay at that age until you resolve it, until you put some things together. So true. So now I want to ask you, so you you made the decision to forgive. You're still in college. You see your parents through the eyes of their humanity, which I imagine was very healing for you. So what, what did you gain because of that? Because that cost you something to mm. forgive. That cost you something to say, I see you for who you are, right? Because now you're letting go of anger, you're letting go of bitterness, things that could have been. So how did you benefit from that decision? What, how did your life change once you made that decision? Well, one, I, I was I was free from being, you know, angry <laughs> at my parents. Um, and and second, you know, the, the other thing is that you have to make a sacrifice in order for you to move forward, like you said. And so um you know, one of the things that it helped me out with is that now I can be more focused, you know, and now I could be focused on what I am in attention, intentional about what I want to do versus, all right, I'm up upset at my parents, right? I'm spending time dwelling on this, being upset, and I can't think about my future. 
Yeah. So it freed me up from looking at my future and also it allowed me to have some purpose in life, you know, versus saying I grew up, you know, in a tough household. I grew up in an urban environment. People that I know, they didn't, you know, make it past the age of 25. You know, I could have been, I could have been stuck there, right? I could have been stuck based on my environment instead of looking to change my environment. And so, um, you know, I, I want to thank many family members, friends, and many people that have helped me to to get to a different place in my life. And so, you know, I tell people, the people that are listening and watching, you know, live, um, thank you all for those comments also. And I will watch the replay is that you have to get to a point where you're not holding a cold that's in your hand. All right. Yes, somebody hurt you, but now you're holding that hot cold. If you keep on holding that hot cold in your hand, you're going to get burnt by it. So yeah. but if you release it, you're not holding it and you won't get hurt by it. And so, so many, so many of us, are, you know, yeah, that person did that to me. You know, yes, that person should pay for, for the issue. Listen, you know what? Yes, they should pay. Yes, they said something wrong to you. But guess what? You need to move on. You know, hey, somebody's watching from Barcelona. What's up, Amy? Yeah, Amy, hey, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your comments. What's up, people? So I always, I, I'm a huge believer that nothing in life just happens to us, right? And it's like mm. everything in life is, is used to further, like you said, our purpose and, and what we're meant, our message, our core message in life. So how do you feel like growing up in that type of environment and going through the, the experiences that you went through and forgiving? How have you taken all of those and infused them into the life that you've built right now? That's a good question. Wow. <laughs> um, you know, this this is this is a, a, a story that I struggle with talking about. Um, the reason why is that, you know, my my father passed away in 2009. My mother's still alive. You know, so there's many times that. I would talk about the way I've grown up and my mother has heard me speak at speaking engagements or, or, or did a talk at church. And a lot of times she didn't like, like me sharing my story. And so I, I would, wouldn't talk about it that much. Yeah. And so I feel now I, I have freedom to talk about it. Um, I feel now that people need to hear this story from a child's point of view or from a, you know, family's point of view of someone that, that lived through this, but someone also that said, I'm not going to let this define me and define my family, but move forward. You know, um, you know, many times right now, I'm like a caretaker off and on for my mother and also my, my brother that struggles with mental illness. And so I still deal with those things. All right. You know, how do you interact with them? You know, how do you keep yourself sane, right? <laughs> Without losing your mind. Yeah. Um, and as, as people know, if you, if you have a, a family member or friend that struggles with mental illness, they when they have a bad day, sometimes those bad days could could be really bad. And do you want to be involved with that bad day? You know, you got you have to make a decision, you know. And so um, one of the things that it has propelled me to do is to, to share my story, but also to help people and say, listen, man, yes, somebody might have this issue, but that doesn't define who they are. They still have purpose. They still have breath in their body. And they, there's an opportunity for them to, to do something different. And so um, there's many people, especially people in, in the people of color community that don't talk about mental illness. I know a lot, a lot of families, um, they don't even want to talk about it. They just want to say uncle so-and-so has a problem. Yeah. They want to say that, you know, they struggle with depression. They struggle with, um, you know, schizophrenia. They spark, they struggle with bipolar. They don't want to say that. And then now when somebody else that's in this generation, the next generation struggles with it. They don't know what to do. But if somebody would have said, listen, you know what? Your mother and your father struggle with this. You should you should look out for that. You should yeah. look out for issues that that come because some of this stuff sometimes is generational and hereditary. And so if you don't know that now when you have an issue now, you now you're struggling even more because no one told you that, you know what? Your, your parents just struggle with this problem. Yeah. And maybe you should look at there's some signs that you need to look at so you could not have that issue like they did. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the, um, you do a lot with encouragement. Yeah. You, one of the things that you do, that's kind of your main message is encouragement. How do you feel like your, your past, your experiences, how do you feel like that set you up to be an encourager? Oh, that's awesome. You know why my past has set me up to encourage people? Because so many times I always hear the bad, 
about people or the bad about, you know, what your parents did or, you know, I have a brother that he was told for many, many, probably 80% of his life um, how bad he was, how he messed up, how he didn't get this right. And you hear it over and over again. I remember taking some training a couple of years back about, um, you know, if I wanted to run for office and be a politician. And one of the, the people said, you know what news sells? The bad stuff, the bloody stuff, the, the bad things. And that's why you hear so many bad things on the news. And I said, how can I be a person to share encouraging information to people versus just sharing how bad something is? And so um, people know how messed up they are. Right. You don't have to tell someone, listen, yeah. man, you know, you blew it on that issue, on that thing today. You know, you blew your money. Right. You know, you messed up your credit. You mess you messed that relationship up. Right. You you know, you you, you got arrested and now you have a, a BCI. People know that they have they got arrested. You don't have to tell them. Yeah. Right? yeah. But how can we encourage them to say, listen, I know that you messed up in the past. Mm -hmm. but How can we help you to move forward from your past towards the future? And yeah. that's what people need to hear. I love that. Okay, so tell us, I know that there's probably hundreds of things that you learned from this experience, but I want you to give me, hey, Leona, I want you to give me what's one just like resounding lesson that you learned from growing up in a household of parents that struggled with mental illness? What's the number one thing that you took away from that? Your, your destiny is greater than your current situation. Mm. And... Everyone is destined for greatness, no matter what someone told them, no matter what what you think of yourself right now, that you're destined for greatness. Now you need to tap inside of you of what that greatness is, right? Stop stop listening to people that say you're never going to be nothing, how you mess something up and start listening to some encouraging information. You know, start reading some books or, or look at some YouTube videos about people that, you know, have gone through some tough tough times, but it actually came out of that tough time in a different, different manner. Yeah. Um, I want you take, taking that same concept of what you learned. Um, I want you to talk directly to the listeners, whether they're live or they're, they're watching it on replay. And I want you to talk to somebody who has faced some form of trauma in their lives. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was in their childhood, maybe teenage years, something that they feel like they just cannot get past. And I want you to give them just a word of advice or a word of encouragement. All right. Well, one, I'm going to put in the comment section, get help. <laughs> <laughs> the number one thing that I tell people, I mean, we can't do this alone. Yeah. And we try to... Um, you know, make sense of many things ourselves, but we all need some help. I, I mean, you might not, you, you might be scared of going to a doctor or a psychiatrist, but they, they are helpful. You know, maybe there's a friend, maybe there's a family member, maybe there's someone that you could talk to, but we all need help, you know, and and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a story. I had two family members that passed away in, in three months, in a three month period, same um, family, but I was doing a counseling, yeah. right? I was doing the encouragement for the family. I was doing the funerals. And I actually, after I finished that, I was so overwhelmed that I actually called a, a called a psychiatrist and I said, can I meet with you? They met with me and they said, why are you meeting with me? They asked me all these questions. I said, well, I need to talk to somebody. And it's like, well, you don't need to talk to me. I said, yeah, I need to talk to someone that I'm not related to. So I need, I, I would tell people, get help, seek out advice, Seek out someone that could look at what's happening to you that may, might not even be related to you, but could say, listen, you know what? Yeah, something is off in this area and you might want to think about these things. Yeah, I love that. Um, Kareem, before we, before we end out, I want you to tell people how you are helping entrepreneurs, business people, consultants. Tell us what you're doing with your business to continue to perpetuate the encouragement and giving people clarity and focus. Sure. Yes. I call, I call myself like a business psychologist. I help mm -hmm. people look at their business and talk about things about their business that they probably might not want to share with their significant other. And so my, the two main things I do, I help them around strategy, growing their revenue and also coming up with a better operation process for their business. So, um, you know, um, a lot of people call me a business coach. Um, 
and I help people, you know, to strategize about growing their revenue. And so um, that's what I love to do. Yeah. Love it. And you um, tell us how we can reach you. I know you put your um, your website in the comments, but tell us how we can reach you, get in contact with you. Sure. I'm going to put my phone number also in the comment section, also my email in the comment section. Please like me on Facebook, Twitter. Um, I don't think anybody else has my name. <laughs> first name last name so yeah. you know uh look at uh go uh, search me um link you know go on linkedin go on twitter go on instagram facebook uh please you know let's let's connect thank yeah. you also for your time and in interviewing me today of course kareem thank you so much for your vulnerability for sharing that personal space with us and i know that you've helped a lot of people and you're going to continue to help them the more that you share your story and to those of you who are watching, Kareem Canson is one of the kindest, most compassionate people I've ever met in my life. And um, it would it would do you well to reach out to him, even to just connect and to see how he can help you and to just gain from his knowledge. So Kareem, thank you again for um, for joining us today. And thank you for all of, all of you who have watched. Make sure that you tune back in on Friday. I have another really amazing guest for Extraordinary Stories with Extraordinary People. Remember, your story is the most powerful asset that you possess. Have a wonderful week, and we will see